Hi. That was a great introduction. Thank you, guys. Uh, but hi, I'm Isa, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about how can we use web performance to be uh, better human beings, basically. Uh, but I'm from Brazil, I'm not sure if you know this, and today we have a very special thing going on. You probably don't know this as well, but today is the Brazilian Independence Day, which is, uh, yay, thank you. <laughs> it means that Brazil is uh, an independent country from Portugal for the last uh, 196 years. Um, but that isn't really what you think the independence is in Brazil. Like, we do not kill and murder aliens, but we do try to fight or organize crime while citizens don't give an absolute fuck about it. Um, and we're actually very good at it. Like, we, we do it quite often. And also, we don't have the whole fireworks things, and as, as we probably know it from the USA, like, the whole 4th of July, it's usually a very big thing. But we do use fireworks to throw at each other and pretend like we're in a Harry Potter movie. And yes, it's completely insane. But anyway, we do it. Um, and another thing about Brazilians is that we're very much addicted to internet. We spend, we're basically the, the country where we, spend, where we spend the most time in the internet. Um, followed by Nigeria and some other countries. And we obviously do it via mobile the most. Just in uh, 2018 alone, we're expected to have almost 96 million people using mobile internet. And that's only going to grow from now. And what you think of mobile internet in Brazil could be something that is very nice because what foreigners actually usually know from Brazil is this very pretty image, which is from Rio. It's, it's actually where I live, and I usually don't have any troubles with it. But what you actually don't know about Brazil is that it has a different side. And it's a country where the inequality just thrives. And it means that you can have both uh, very rich people and very poor people living in the same space and using the same stuff. That picture is actually true, obviously. It's uh, in a neighborhood in Sao Paulo called Paraisópolis. And that inequality also is reflected on the web and the digital projects that we build every day. And today I'm going to show you a little bit about how can we overcome this problem and, and just make sure that the internet is still usable for absolutely everyone. So, I'm Isa. I'm a software engineer working code. This is my actual true talent. If you like my talks, you should definitely catch me up on the party. Um, and coming back to the subject, um, Brazil, yeah, we really are very addicted to the internet. Um, and obviously, the, most ex the, the bigger number of access is made via mobile because uh, the internet, the cable internet in Brazil is still very expensive. Uh, let alone uh, prices of uh, desktop computers and stuff. So 94% uh, of the people usually use mobile because uh, the, the devices are more affordable and the uh, mobile data plan is usually very cheap. And um, while 77% of the rest of the people still use desktop, but the mobile thing is a very strong uh, trend in Brazil nowadays. And by being mobile, if we look at the, the map and see the 4G availability, we can see that Brazil is like not doing so fine, but it's also not that bad. Um, we have 61% of 4G availability, which comparing to other countries is not the best thing ever. Like we're pretty low here in the scale, especially if we compare ourselves to Sweden, for instance. Like you're, you guys are way above us and we're... Um, in that shitty area. But that also means that 40% of the population don't have access to 4G, which we could think like, okay, good, it's, it's more the majority, so I guess it's fine. But in numbers, that means that over 83 million of people don't have access to 4G, and let alone like the devices, that only 44% of the devices in Brazil currently are compatible to 4G. Usually, they're just uh, GSM or even 3G connections. And if we think of the speed, go, going back a little more for the, the whole picture on the world, um, we can see that the, the speed in various places actually isn't that good as we expected. And if we think about the whole spectrum, only 60% of the, the, the connections are in 2G, like throughout the world. And that's become uh, very evident when you, for example, when you travel somewhere else, like a different country, 
Most、uh, carriers give you free roaming, but that means that you have to use 2G, and that sucks. Like that's a reality that we're not completely used to it, and it's a big thing because if you think about how the internet is nowadays, we can see that it also changed.、Uh, for example, in 2012,、uh, we had over sort of like、uh, an average of 500 million pictures being shared every day, and nowadays we can see that it's over seven billion. Images being shared every day online, and and that's become the sort of cultural thing. Like we are very much used to communicating through images because it's easier to understand because it sends your message in a more effective way, and because like how else are we going to share our memes? So we need images. But that represents a 1,200 percent increase in the number of images, which is basically the the heaviest asset that we could possibly share online, and. Page size has also changed. In in 2012, 2011, we had an average of 929 kilobytes per page. Nowadays, we have over three megabytes in in an average web page, and that counting for images, for videos, for scripts. And I mean, obviously, images are going to take up the most, the biggest size. But also, I'm very concerned about the scripts part. Because it means that we could have done better, and that's the part where we can act the most, and we're、um, currently not that much concerned. And the web was supposed to be for everyone. If we think of like the chances and the opportunities that we have while developing this, is not really the same thing as our users are going to get. We usually get to test and get to develop for、uh, on a very expensive MacBook, on the best、uh, internet、uh, internet connections. Or even like with a very big monitor screen, and but that's not reality. And most people don't have the same、uh, velocity in the connection. They don't even have access to the best devices. So that could mean that we're possibly limiting their experience on something that's very important, like、uh, educational content, or、um, maybe the person can look for jobs because he doesn't have access to the places where people post jobs. So that's a big thing that could have a very deep impact on on the lives of people. But okay, we can talk about more important things.、Uh, let's talk about where it actually hurts.、Uh, in terms of money and and capital venture and success,、uh, we know that an average of 53% of the visits on website are completely abandoned if your website takes more than three seconds to load, and If you think about the average that a website takes to load nowadays, it's currently 19 seconds. That's a lot more than three. And on the contrary, if the, if we think about the good parts of having a fast website, like a website that loads in under five seconds,、uh, it has. On average, 25% more viewability on ads, which is something that's very important nowadays because that's、uh, how many websites are monetized. So making sure that your users are viewing the ads that you're displaying is also very important.、Um, the websites that have the concept of section of sessions and login usually have 70% longer sessions if they carry and if they load really fast. And they also have 35% lower bounce rate, which is when a user goes into your website and he leaves right afterwards. And also, Pinterest had a very interesting case when they they did a number of performance enhancements, and they have very very important metrics on how how well they did it. And they have 40% decrease on the load time, which is very significant because it really. Talks about the satisfaction in which their users are using their platform.、Uh, they also have an increase of、uh, 15% in both SEO traffic, which is also very important because that's how your users are going to find your website, and also in conversion rate to sign up, which is probably the core thing on that defines the success of their platform. And also Netflix.、Um, Had a 43% uh, decrease on the bandwidth bill after turning on Gzip, which is a very、uh, simple thing to do. It doesn't require that much effort, and they were able to save a lot of money because of it. So we can think,、uh, and we can actually spot a pattern into it. When we optimize for access democracy, when we think about performance、uh, in order to make people see what we see when we access the website, we also get a very nice competitive advantage. And cost reduction for free because、uh, we're already doing it in order to make sure that every user gets the same experience, but we also get all these nice stuff within it. So cool. Okay, 
So what are you what are you start optimizing? Because uh, that's usually a thing. People don't really know where to start, and it's it's obviously a fuzzy thing because you really have to know your website in order to start optimizing. So my first advice here is just uh, start by measuring ev absolutely everything. Like get every single metric that you can possibly get from your website so you can identify the bottlenecks and see whatever you can start optimizing. Um, there's a few metrics that are very important in order for us to realize if our website is doing good. Uh, the first of them are the first paint and the first meaningful paint. The first paint is uh, very important because it shows us when our, our website is beginning to be displayed for the user. That has a big impact on the experience because the fastest we can get that metric going, the more impression to the user that the website is really fast. Um, and the first meaningful paint is basically when we can uh, sort of like finish uh, rendering the, the part on the website which is above the fold, which is that one that we usually see um, when the user hasn't scrolled yet. And that's also where after the, the web fonts are, are finished loading and they're already displayed. So that's also a very important moment in the rendering uh, flow on our website. And the other very important metric is time to interactive, which is when the scripts are done being parsed and we can finally interact with the website in a, in a more like satisfying way because we make sure that all the buttons are working. If I interact with um, basically something that has to transition, it's going to respond to us. So that usually takes more time, obviously, because uh, parsing the script is something that takes the longest for the browser to achieve. Uh, but it's also very important that we know exa exactly when we're going to reach that point. Um, but getting those metrics isn't the most trivial thing. I mean, obviously, if we just try to get those metrics just by looking at our website and looking at the, the watch on our wrist, it's not going to be the best thing because they have to be very precise. And there's no way to actually know when what's happening and what's going to happen before, after. So there's a very, set, very important set of tools that we can use. The first one that I, uh, I started using the most was webpagetest.org. And it provides us some very interesting reports. Uh, here is very tiny, but you can totally check that out later. The important thing to notice here is that like, web page tests usually grades the website according to some uh, nice parameters, like how fast it can load, and what's the availability, and what's the ping. Anyway, and it also gives us the metrics that we're looking for, and, and also some cool graphs, if you like graphs. And, but the, the tool that I use the most is usually Chrome DevTools, which uh, I guess all of you are very used to using because we use a console every time and we check out the elements. You can also use that to measure performance. And it also has this very nice ally nowadays, which is called Lighthouse. On Chrome DevTools, I really like the fact that we can just like look at it and glance for a second and know absolutely what's happening in each part of the rendering phase. We can even uh, realize how much time our website is taking to render and uh, how, how much time it is spent on, on scripting, which is a very good thing for us to be aware of what's the current landscape in our website. We can even simulate different conditions than when we're actually developing it, because if we have the best internet, how are we going to possibly know what a user with a low-end phone is, is seeing at the moment? So you can do the simulation of how it would render and load in a, in a slow 3G connection. And also you can simulate throttling, which is like when you simulate that uh, on a device with a low CPU or a low uh, hardware capacity, you can totally simulate those things, which I think it's one of the most important thing when you're developing and thinking about performance, is first of all, knowing what your users are possibly going to be seeing. And Lighthouse gives you a very interesting report as well. Uh, as you can see, uh, the first part that it gives you is those uh, metrics you have, like time to render and time to interactive. You can exactly know how much is it taking. And it even gives you sort of a, a notion of if, if that's good, if that's bad, it, it sort of paints it in orange. And you can even see the frame, which is also very nice, like divided by the time. 
And also, uh, a very interesting thing that they also proposed in Lighthouse is the fact that they not even they not just tell you what's wrong, but they also suggest some improvements that you can do uh, to improve your website. I think that's a, a more guided experience into optimizing your website. You can have this good friend, uh, which is Lighthouse, sort of guiding you through uh, where you should start optimizing what you, and what you should do. And most of all, I think one of the most important parts that you really have to know, it's one of the most important metrics that you have to check, is really who your users are. And that's uh, the actual metrics for a website uh, that I developed in Brazil. And you can see that it's completely confusing all over the place, because you see that the first, uh, the, the most used device is the Apple iPhone. And right after that is a very low-end Motorola for the, for the time. So in the case of development in Brazil, uh, that could actually mean that you don't know your users because they can be anyone. But you need to know and you need to have that idea. So using the Google Analytics or some sort of uh, tracker for knowing who your users are, are is usually very important as well. And but after that, like I, I saw the metrics and I knew what to do and I could measure my website, but I didn't really know uh, where to start and what to do about it. So I came up with this concept, which I, I like to call it like the three pillars of web development, um, which later on I formed this concept that I call uh, the three S's of web optimization. And yes, is that a, another bullshit term that I just made up? Yes, it is. But it helps me to realize what I could be doing to improve my website health. Um, so the three assets for me are to ship less code. Uh, the less code we ship to production, that is a better experience for our users because it's going to take less time. And to shrink whatever you're sending, like if you have to send something, just make sure that it's going to be small enough. And also to serve effectively, which has a lot to do with infrastructure and the DevOps part, but it's also something that we have to make sure that it's working correctly. So on shipping less code, two things that we can do is just to do code splitting, which is a concept that is really uh, high at the moment. People are really talking about code splitting. It's become a very common concern in the lives of uh, web developers. And by minding your stack. So on code splitting, there's a few things that we could do, uh, especially if you use Webpack, it sort of makes your life simpler in that way. There's a, a plugin that I, uh, I really like to use, and it's called Split, uh, Split Chunks Plugin. What it does is just to deduplicate all the libraries that you have. Like if, if you have the same library being used in more than one place, it just condenses all of them and provides it to you just once on the final bundle. Uh, the next thing is to use dynamic imports uh, to import your modules. Basically, all you have to do is just write import as a function uh, and pass the, the path of your module that you want to import as a parameter, and then it's going to return you a promise. So you just have to like, chain the then, and right after that, you can already start using uh, the function that you like. And other thing that maybe if you're using a, a framework like React or Vue, you can also do route-based code splitting because it's uh, it's basically built in in React Router and stuff. And basically, it takes it, it takes care of the fact that making sure if you're if you're serving the exact content that your user is actually seeing in a page. Um, and there is a few ways that you can do it manually, but I really do think, and as nowadays most of us are using frameworks. It's much easier for you to just get a, a made-up approach in that sense. And the next thing is to just be more critical about your stack. Like, um, don't don't try to use frameworks just because they're very famous at the moment and you'd like to give it a try in production. Because sometimes it may even be the case that you don't actually need them. There's a famous case that was um, going on in Twitter for a while, and it's the case where Netflix thought that there was a certain module where they were using React, and they realized, OK, but we don't necessarily need it right here. And they took it off, and they saw that there was a 50% performance improvement on, on the load time, the, the time that a user spent trying to load the page. 50% is quite a lot, so that's a big deal. I mean, I'm not saying that we should all stop using frameworks and stuff, but just make sure that you really need it and that it's really going to make uh, your life easier for development. And if you do use it, just make sure that you know all the correct uh, performance enhancements that you can do directly for that framework. 
The next thing is to shrink stuff. Um, if you are serving um, all the files that you need to be serving, especially libraries, you need to make sure that they're tiny enough. So that usually goes for images. And on image compression, it's usually very well known, all the approaches that we can use. Like we can use SVGO for SVGs, and there's a bunch of plugins for image compression on uh, PNG and JPEG. Uh, if you're using Webpack again, there's a good plugin that's called Image Compression Plugin. They can use it, it's all like into it. You can uh, use it with any sorts of formats for your image. And the next very important thing is just to don't be that guy that serves an image that's like three times the size that's the one that's being used in production because you're sending so many unnecessary bytes to the user. Like if you're cropping the image, just make sure that you serve it in the size that you're going to actually use in the website. The next thing is just to minify resources. I think that's one of the most common ways that people know about optimizing and minifying bundles. Um, there is very well-known approaches for that in HTML, which I really like to use the HTML minifier. Uh, for CSS, there's CSSO. And for JS, I usually use Uglify, and it has always been like, very useful for me. What, what they all do, basically, is just remove all the empty spaces that well, the user is not going to need on the final bundle, because it's important for us as developers to make sure that like, the code is well indented and we can understand what's happening. They're really good for readability. But after we ship it to production, we don't really have to have all the formatation in place and they don't even have to look good. So what the minifier does is basically to remove those unnecessary bytes. And that shrinks a lot the size of the bundle. So make sure you're using that as well. And the next thing and final thing in shrinking stuff, I think it's one of the most important things you can actually do. Uh, is to optimize web fonts. We, we usually use web fonts because, well, the designer is going crazy in some layouts and he wants like five different fonts. Uh, but we can and have ways to make that better in real life. Uh, first of all, we can do character subsetting, which is a practice of uh, basically, if you're going to use an, a font just because you need the numbers, you can totally just use the numbers part of the, or of the file. That way, you can have like smaller font files and you can just ship what the person's going to need. Um, so it's a really interesting thing. If you see that you're using like just numbers or just um, uppercase letters or just lowercase letters, make sure that you actually separate and don't get the full thing on the font file. Loading fonts asynchronously is also very important because uh, web fonts are a thread blocking call. So if you need to, to render the fonts, and they're usually very heavy uh, assets, you're also going to be blocking the whole CSS from continuing rendering. So that's a bad thing. Um, to, in order to achieve that, the, all, the only thing that you need to do is just put async by the side of the tag. Usually, you have a tag for importing the resources on the index file of the HTML. Just make sure you add async to it, and that's it. Another very um, popular problem that we usually have with uh, font styles is the fact that we get FOIT, which is uh, the flash of invisible text, and, or the flash of unstyled text, which is FOUT. And in order to deal with that better, there's a very interesting API called the Font Face Observer, in which you can actually control uh, what class you want to give to a div that didn't have the fonts rendered yet. And you can actually control uh, how the fonts are going to be displayed before the font is loaded. So you can really match the style of the actual font that you're using. So you can like, tweak the line heights and the letter spacing and try to find a font family that's similar to the one that you're trying to load. So the impact for the user is uh, the least uh, possible. And the thing that I'm most excited about at this point about web fonts are the variable fonts. They're reasonably young uh, in, in a way. Like the project of uh, the, ver the variable fonts isn't going for that much. I think it's uh, a couple of years. But it's really nice because basically you can just have one file to handle all the font weights. And you can end up with something like this. Uh, you can totally tweak what the weight that you want. And that is just one file. Because usually we have to use like one file for the weight 500, another one for the 400. And that means that we usually have to send down, I don't know, like five different files just for the same font. And that thing is going to allow us just to send the one and, and get all the font weights that we need. And that's really revolutionary in terms of uh, performance. 
And uh, the compatibility is still not that great, but it's getting there. As you can see, uh, it's going to be supported by the next release of Firefox. Um, so it's not the best yet, but uh, we should totally keep it in our radar because uh, soon it's, it's going to become more popular, and that's, that means that we can probably use it in more places. So it's definitely a thing that's worth keeping an eye on. The last thing is just to serve effectively, because uh, we also have a, a very um, big need for, for minding the whole infrastructure and the whole service thing. So making sure you're gzipping all the text-based assets, which is a very effective way of uh, a compression, it, it's usually a game changer for the user because it's going to load all the resources a lot faster since they're all very tiny in comparison to the non-compressed version. Um, the browser is still going to have to uh, decompress it, and the, the actual uh, size of the code that you're sending is not going to change because of gzip. But it's definitely going to create more, uh, create faster uh, HTTP requests, and that's going to be better for the user. And just to set it up is very simple. Basically, you just have to add that to your Nginx file or whatever you're using for the server. I install a Webpack plugin, which is called Compression Webpack Plugin and configure it in Webpack. Basically, you just need to send out all the formats that you want your files to be compressed in, and configure the headers of whatever it is that you're using as a, as a uh, backend technology. In this case, I'm using Node, but you can totally do that and anything else that you're using to serve the route. Uh, the next one is the CDN, which is a very interesting practice as well, because uh, you can leverage and you can benefit from a, a very uh, massive uh, amount of, of servers. Uh, services like AWS and Cloudflare um, usually offer that service. And it's great because you can actually serve the content from your website according to the localization from your users, which uh, generates, it leads to lesser uh, ping, ping uh, amounts and uh, the requests are usually faster. So that's also a really good thing if you have enough money to, to implement it. And the also revolutionary thing in terms of serving files right now is uh, HTTP2. Uh, and it's very different from the one because uh, it's more performant in a way, like it, the way that it's done inside is faster. And you can actually just, if you need three different resources from the same source, uh, before the HTTP one would just hand out three um, replies, and the HTTP two is just going to send everything you need and everything you requested on a single uh, response. So that's also really good in terms of performance. So those are very interesting tips, and I think if you manage to implement most of them, you can already uh, start dancing like Carlton. Uh, it's a good thing. Your website is more performant. And even, you, you can even improve that if you take a look at these good practices. Uh, the first one is just to set a performance budget, which is like having a goal. Um, I'm going to make sure that my website, the final bundle for my website is going to be under uh, 200 kilobytes or I'm going to make sure that my page renders in less than five seconds. You, you need to have goals. Those are very helpful in terms of uh, knowing when you're achieving the place that you want to go. The second one is just to remember to always test on real phones uh, in order for you to just get outside the bubble that we developers usually are when we are developing a new thing, um, to make sure that our users are really seeing uh, the same thing that we are implementing, the way that we see it is very important. Uh, because they're probably not going to have the, the high-end uh, devices that we do. We, as people who work in tech, are usually very privileged in a way. So uh, making sure that you're actually testing on their devices could actually really help. And there, the last thing is just to start optimizing early. Just always keep that in mind ever since you start the project. Otherwise, uh, you can do the, the performance improvements earlier, and you can, la you can have less refactoring. But the key takeaways that I want to leave in this talk are not just uh, the technical part, but yes, the social part. Like I, I think developers have a, a very big responsibility in terms of making sure that we are achieving social inclusion, and that is really our job. Like what I see and what I hear the most is developers saying, "Okay, but we're not doctors. If we screw up, we're not going to kill anyone." But yeah, just making sure the information is getting everywhere is just as important as not killing anyone. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. And we also have to remember that it's still up to us that the web is still a place for everyone. And it should be, because uh, 
the web is really a thing nowadays. The internet is really all over the place. Everything is just basically ruled by the internet. So making sure that it serves for everyone is really important, is essential. And that's it, Taxa Uh Thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Chocolate.